In Cairo, a muezzin calls faithful Muslims to prayer. It's the same call that sounds five times a day, every day, in cities across the world. Nearly a quarter of the people on earth respond to it bound together by the enduring spirit of Islam. God is most great, the Muezzin calls. I testify there is no other God but God. I testify Muhammad is the messenger of God. Come and pray. Come and flourish. God is most great. There is no God but God. In the unfolding of history, Islamic civilization has been one of humanity's grandest achievements. A worldwide power founded simply on faith. A spiritual revolution that would shape the nations of three continents and launch an empire. For the West, much of the history of Islam has been obscured behind a veil of fear and misunderstanding. Yet Islam's hidden history is deeply and surprisingly interwoven with Western civilization. It was Muslim scholars who reclaimed the ancient wisdom of the Greeks while Europe languished in the Dark Ages. It was they who sowed the seeds of the Renaissance 600 years before the birth of Leonardo da Vinci. From the way we heal the sick, to the numerals we use for counting, cultures across the globe have been shaped by Islamic civilization. But all this began with the life of a single, ordinary man and the profound message he proclaimed would change the world forever. His name was Muhammad. To Muslims, the life of Muhammad is a story revered. In its mysteries, as much as its certainties, there are beliefs held sacred. Whatever we can tell about the Prophet, of course, is screened through the filter of what has been preserved over the centuries and what people have wanted to preserve. And it's very difficult to pull out from all of these different sources that are very adoring and the ordinary human being, that, uh, the, the, the person that he was. We do know that Muhammad was born in or around 570 AD in the sun-blasted Arabian Peninsula, a land of savage scarcity whose Bedouin tribes were locked in a constant state of tribal war.
While still an infant, Muhammad's parents gave him his first taste of life in the desert. Muhammad was from a town, Mecca, but he was sent off to live with the Bedouin because the people, even in the town of Mecca, felt that the Bedouin were the holders of the, the deeper cultural Arab values. And the Bedouin view the townspeople as having lost their really authentic roots in Arab culture and the poetry and, and uh, animal husbandry and all the things that uh, they, they do so well. By the time Muhammad was six, both of his parents had died. And he was taken under the protection of his uncle, chief of his clan. Being an outsider gave him a singular perspective. He'd been orphaned early and developed very early on a passionate sense of concern for those who are left out of society. Uh, to be orphaned in a tribal society where clan and family relationships are your keys to everything, success, status, honor, dignity, um, is, is to face what it really feels like to be marginalized. And that obviously had a, a, a very deep impression on him as a young man. In some ways, it was detrimental, of course, to grow up without parents, but in other ways, he was so adaptable. He had many parents, he had many fathers, he had many mothers, so it made him a child of everybody. Muhammad's clan, like Arabs all across the Arabian Peninsula, would share the stories that had been told and retold for generations. Pre-Islamic Arabian civilization was largely an oral culture and uh, there was tremendous respect for and admiration for people who could express themselves orally, and especially those who could recite poetry almost at the drop of a hat. Some of the most important people in a tribe were the poets. As they sang of the glory of the tribe, they they, ta they told the story of the tribe. To the Bedouin, the word had a mystical importance. Poets linked the tribe to its ancestors and celebrated values older than memory. Poetry was the sinew that bound the Bedouin together, celebrating their victories, lamenting their defeats. The poems themselves, like the poems of Homer, both celebrate this great heroic ethos and yet intimate in the deepest way the tragedy that um, this war, this ethos of constant tribal warfare uh, brings to people. Warfare and conflict were the grim realities of a dangerous time. Muhammad's uncle taught him the skills he'd need to survive in a world where even a prophet would wield a bow and arrow. In a wilderness punished by the elements and bereft of water, rivalry over a single well could provoke a blood feud for generations. A real rivalry, real battles, and sometimes quite bloody. So the allegiance of individuals was to the family, immediately and at a larger extent to the tribe. Without the tribe's protection, no one could endure. Scattered across the peninsula were countless factions, all embroiled in bitter struggles, each defending its precious grazing lands, trade routes, and most importantly, its wells. Well, you have to understand, in most of the lands are dry. And so water is, is something that oh, everyone always considers precious. For those of us in climates that are more heavily watered, it's difficult to understand the depth and the centrality of the symbol of water in societies that uh, are desert and in which uh, it only rains once or twice a year and in which uh, a little water makes the difference between life and death. Each clan had its own separate gods and totems, to water and wind, fire and night. They were kept in the caravan town of Mecca, 
in a shrine of wood, stone and cloth. It was called the Kaaba, the Arabic word for cube. Pre-Islamic Arabs worshipped a number of spirits, and they were generally nature-oriented spirits, sometimes associated with natural, natural features like trees or rocks or springs. And uh, the Kaaba in Mecca was one of a number of these sanctuaries centered around a particular cluster of deities. It was said the Hebrew patriarch, Abraham himself, built the Kaaba centuries before and that a sacred black stone it held within had fallen from the sky. In these turbulent times, the Kaaba provided a rare place of peace. Only here would the Bedouin submit to a temporary truce before returning to their conflicts of the open sands. There was this one place in the middle, around the Kaaba, which was, from even pre-Islamic times, was a place of uh, a sacred enclosure where all people had to put down their arms. And this, of course, facilitated trading uh, because it meant that you couldn't carry on your feuds when you were doing your buying and selling. The spiritual and economic importance of the Kaaba in Mecca are pretty hard to separate in, in, as far as the pre-Islamic Arabs are concerned. The Kaaba made Mecca a vibrant center for trade. Here were found Arabian incense, exotic perfumes and Indian spices, Chinese silks and Egyptian linens. But perhaps the greatest treasure to be found at Mecca was the rich mixture of cultures. There were people who came through town who had all kinds of interesting experiences to relate to faraway places. The local religion was mixed. There were Christians, there were Jews, and there were also the Arabs of the desert who followed an animist type of religion. Muhammad's world was a center of trade, connecting the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean, linking the aging empires of Byzantium and Persia to the great bazaars of India and China. Muhammad became a merchant. In fact, he had a great flair for trade. At the age of 25, while leading a caravan northward to Syria, his talents caught the eye of the shipment's owner, a wealthy widow named Khadija. She was so taken with Muhammad, she proposed marriage. Ah, Khadija. Well, I think she was a mentor as well as a wife, a very strong lady who had her own business, and Muhammad was helping her out. So it was a wonderful partnership, and I'm sure he learned a lot from her. He had a tremendous amount of contact with merchants coming from different parts uh, of the world, passing through the Arabian Peninsula. I think he was a very intelligent man, very open-minded, and he was able to communicate with a great variety of peoples. He must have had great charisma as well. Mohammed had a way with people and with resolving their disputes. Once, when the Kaaba fell into disrepair, the clan chieftains quarreled over who would have the honor of putting the sacred black stone back where it belonged. Before violence could erupt, Mohammed proposed an equitable solution. United in the effort, the four leaders shared the weight and the honor. In gratitude, they invited Muhammad himself to replace the sacred stone. He became known as Al-Amin, the trusted one. There are all kinds of indications that he was tremendously interested in, in religious questions. This is obviously not something that an ordinary person probably was interested in in those days. He talked to uh, 
sages, Arab sages. He talked to Jewish and Christian sages who lived in the area. He used to go up into the rock hills around Mecca and meditate, think about things. And at some point had this extraordinary vision, which is spoken about very evocatively and elusively. In a cave above Mecca, Muhammad had an experience that would be the defining moment of his life. An angel was said to appear before him in the form of a man, instructing him to recite in the name of God, the Almighty. For Muhammad, it was an encounter as profound as it was deeply disturbing. You get a sense of what it would be like to be a normal person in society, perhaps unusual in the sense of your intensity for things like social justice and finding out what the meaning of life is, but not being uh, endowed with anything that would seem, seem miraculous by your friends. And all of a sudden having this voice come to you and then come out of you as you speak it and recite it to other people. And that is the beginning of the prophetic career of Muhammad. The months to come would bring more revelations. Powerful words of a lyrical quality, more beautiful than the most exquisite Arabic poetry. Above all, Muhammad was to bear one message to his people, a simple yet radical proclamation, that there is only one God. The central tenet of Islam is the oneness, the indivisible unity of God, uh, not something that is simply, uh, that one pays lip service to, but something that is absolutely the most important concept. Divine unity is more than saying God is, there's only one God and there aren't other, other deities. It's only thinking about one thing. So to be thinking about possessions, to be thinking about status, to be thinking about power, are all intellectual idols. The implications were staggering. One God meant one people. No more tribal divisions. To the poor and unprotected, the prospect was revolutionary. Seems to me that one of the most important things of, in his early teaching that isn't, isn't often talked about is the strong social justice message that he delivered. In Mecca of the time, there was an increasing separation between the haves and the have-nots. He insisted that it, this was not to be and that we should share the wealth. And uh, it was this social justice message that I think that really got him a hearing among many of the folks. So coming with Islam, it was a new order, a new way of life. And it was a beautiful way of life because everybody was equal, black, white, men, women, children. So it had that type of uh, universal appeal, which I think was the reason why Islam spread so rapidly. Many were moved by Muhammad's message as he began to speak out in the community. It had the suppleness and symbolic depth of the great pre-Islamic poems that had been created by this people and that had given this people in Arabia such an extraordinary ear for verbal expression, where verbal expression was the commanding cultural force. Some people called him a poet, and there's a Quranic uh, surah basically saying, uh, Muhammad is not a poet. Poets speak through desire. Uh, this is not the voice of desire, this is the voice of God. Muhammad's following began to grow. They called themselves Muslims, for those who surrender to God. They set out to preserve the message Muhammad had brought. This was the beginning of the Quran. 
The Quran was revealed orally, but very soon people realized that it had to be written down in order to make sure that it wasn't corrupted and that the original message was maintained. And from a very early date, and it's, it's very unclear when that date was, because no early manuscripts of the Quran survived, people began copying it down. The Quran is a revelation of spiritual teaching, of both ethical and social guidance. It was revealed and remains in Arabic. What's so extraordinary about the Quran is its naturalness, so that it can say the most powerful cosmic things with a sense of, of intimacy, so that power and tenderness come together constantly in the Quranic language. With words alone, the Quran delivers its vision to the faithful. Its imagery conjures a picture of the afterlife that resonates with all the power of traditional Bedouin poetry. Imagine yourself in the desert, surrounded by dust, by the glare of the sun. You wear cloaks to cover your body because the wind will just sear your skin right off your face. And you walk into an oasis. The temperature drops dramatically. There's a quiet there. The wind is no longer howling. Everywhere you look, you see green and color. The uh, world of water and paradise are symbolically tied to one another. And the Quran can conjure that up with just a few briefly chosen words. Yet for all the imagery of paradise in the Quran, there was no easy description of God. The mystery would remain. It's very difficult to talk about God without reifying God, reifying to make God into a thing, or anthropomorphizing God, to make God into a projection of our own human self. And that's why Muslims don't uh, like sculpture, for example, traditionally, because they believe that there's that danger. And the Quran avoids that by constantly shifting the pronouns so we can't really reify God and get a, an image, a physical image of God. Rather than a physical image of God or of Muhammad, it is the beauty of the Quran itself that is celebrated in Islam. Islam developed in this context where pictures were not favored. The Quran, as it was revealed, was God's representation on earth, and Muslims felt from a very early time that the only just representation of God, God's word, was the Quran itself, not any picture of, of, of God, certainly not, because you couldn't represent God, and certainly not a picture of Muhammad, because he wasn't divine. At certain times and places, people did make images of the Prophet Muhammad, but these are not religious images. These are not images meant to be worshipped. They're not images of a saint or of God. They are images of Muhammad as a historical figure. He's sort of given honor by having a very bright blue background or a white cloud near him, um, but he's, he's not otherwise distinguished from the other characters in the story. At other times, People did represent the prophet, but he was always represented with a white cloth over his face to hide his face, so that there were different approaches to doing this. But in all of these, this, these are not devotional images. You're not supposed to look at them and pray towards them. You're to learn more about the history of your religion with the emphasis on history from them. As Muhammad's community grew, so did the opposition. People, of course, were skeptical and said, look, if you're a prophet, where's your miracle? And the prophets in the Quran, uh, Moses had miracles, Jesus had miracles. Where's your, where's your miracle? 
The Quranic answer to that challenge is this is the miracle, this Quran. But that wasn't miracle enough for the people who defined themselves by the gods of their ancestors and the totems of their tribe. Their doubts increased. The idea of life after death appalled them. So the Quran presents people as really being skeptical. You mean to tell me that after I die and my body has, has gone back to the elements and I've been putrefied, that I'm going to be put back together again and brought back to life? That, of any of the messages in the Quran, that struck the people of Arabia as being the most hard to believe. Muhammad also spoke of eternal damnation for the unjust. He used the language of apocalyptic imagery, talking about the signs of the ends of time, when the mountains crumble, when the skies are rolled up like scrolls. Then you will know what responsibility you bear for your actions. There are references uh, to those who are unjust going to the fire. To the non-believers, the divine reckoning Muhammad invoked was an outrage. His dismantling of their heritage and customs deeply unsettling. It was a threat, a threat in several ways, to their social order, to their age-old traditions, and an economic threat because of the importance of the pilgrimage shrine of the Kaaba in Mecca. As Muhammad's following increased, the social fabric of the caravan city began to unravel. Business suffered as pilgrims and traders, worried for their safety, left town. The tribal leaders decided Muhammad and his message must be removed permanently. They didn't want him taking over, they didn't want him horning in on their control of the city. They made things very difficult for him, perhaps even plotted his assassination. They tried to keep him away from the Kaaba. They did everything they could to kind of run him out of town. They demanded that Muhammad's uncle remove his clan's protection from the Prophet, which would clear the way for his murder without the threat of retribution. But his uncle refused. The battle lines were drawn. Nothing short of tribal war would settle the conflict now. Muhammad is clearly asked to do extraordinary things, to tell the Bedouin to give up um, many of their notions of multiple gods, um, to give up their attachment to their ancestors and their tribal warfare in the way they had, uh, things that would, could and did make him the object of scorn, persecution, um, and um, an attack. Muhammad's followers were forced from the marketplace and starved. Those without clan protection were tortured and killed. In 619 AD, Muhammad's wife, Khadija, died, and his uncle as well. Gone were his first great love and his only protector. Here at last was the opportunity his enemies had been waiting for. But in the lush oasis town of Yathrib, north of Mecca, a refuge opened to Muhammad and his people Clan rivalries had become deadly in the town, and they desperately needed a peacemaker. They had heard that Muhammad was a very trustworthy man. They, they heard that he had great arbitration skills, and they thought, let's see if we can't get him up here and help us out. So they invited him. Muhammad agreed to travel to Yathrib and settle their disputes in exchange for a safe refuge for his people. For Muhammad's followers, 
leaving the place of their ancestors, their families and tribes, was the ultimate test of devotion. In doing so, they began a new community, a new tribe. For the first time, they were bound together not by blood, but by faith. In the course of a single caravan journey, Islam marks its true beginnings. Their journey is known as the Hijra. 622 in the Christian calendar marks the Muslim year one. Muhammad's goal among the people of Yathrib was the same as his larger mission, to bring unity and peace with his message. He was asked to be a Solomonic figure, to mediate tensions between tribes that seemed intractable. As his work succeeded, the town would become known as the city of the prophet, Medina. Muhammad's great task in Medina was to try and bring together these various groups and to try and forge a, a community of believers in a way that would uh, bring people together in a sort of harmony. To the divided clans of Medina, Muhammad offered a vision of solidarity. But even as he spread the word of Islam, he didn't challenge the beliefs of other faiths. Islam sees itself in relationship to the earlier revealed religions of Judaism and Christianity and treats them as people of the book. It believes that God had revealed himself, his word, to mankind many times, to Moses, to Jesus, for example, and, but each time people went astray. Throughout the Quran, we have a sense of the humanity of Muhammad, his humbleness as a person, and the extraordinary challenge of the mission he was given by this divine revelation. As the Muslim community grew in Medina, a life of simple devotion and ritual developed. A freed Abyssinian slave named Bilal was the first to call believers to prayer at Muhammad's house. Allah Akbar! Allah Akbar! It was the first mosque. Allah Akbar! Allah Akbar! The call to prayer has within it the first Islamic pillar, which is the affirmation of God's unity. La ilaha illallah, that beautiful phrase which many Muslims chant over and over in their mind or vocally to constantly remind themselves of the unity of God and the unity of what we should focus on in our life. Praying together is a good thing. It cements the idea of belonging to a movement, to a religion, to an organization, to a community. The result is something very, very powerful, even to watch, even for a non-believer or someone from another religion. We carry out physical gestures of prayer in worship that unify our body and our mind and our soul all at the same moment of, of uh, bowing and touching our head to the ground toward that exact center. Uh, what could be a more powerful symbol of unity? It's said that while he was in Medina, Muhammad received a revelation instructing those in prayer to face in the direction of the Kaaba in Mecca. Though filled with pagan idols, it was still the shrine of Abraham, 
the first believer in the one true God. But even as the Muslims were praying toward Mecca, their enemies there were rallying in force. Their goal, to wipe out the Muslims. Muhammad's people began to gather arms. Though the Muslims prepared as best they could, they were outnumbered and outmatched. They mustered a force of only 313, mostly old men and boys, with few weapons. While the approaching Meccans were heavily armed and a thousand strong. For years, Muhammad had tried to bring Islam to the people of Mecca peacefully. Now it was time to fight. The Muslims faced their own tribes, brother fighting brother, son against father. Yet they came armed with a powerful weapon, a passionate belief in their faith. Muhammad's troops fought with every confidence that God's will was guiding them. They fought three very, very bloody battles. Um, at one point, the entire young Muslim community was right on the edge of annihilation. For three years, the Muslim army held out against staggering odds. As word of the fighting spread, other Bedouin tribes saw God's hand in Muhammad's victories. One by one, the peoples of the desert began to join in his struggle. The Muslim army grew, and the tide began to turn. The Muslim forces advanced to the outskirts of Mecca. It was a furious siege that lasted for nearly a month. Until, finally, the city fell to Muhammad. In 630 AD, the terrified people of Mecca braced for the onslaught. Muhammad's army was returning home now 10,000 strong. The vanquished knew the terrible fate that awaited them. According to the modes of tribal warfare, the Meccans could expect a big revenge. The men are usually killed. Uh, women and children are sold into slavery. There's little pity for the loser in a tribal war. Of course, that's standard around the world. But Muhammad had a surprise in store for the fallen city. When Muhammad came into Mecca, and not only did not carry out a bloody revenge, but actually embrace the very Meccans who had fought him for three years and attempted to annihilate him. It was very shocking to uh, the people in his milieu. So um, within the very founding of a religion, one finds episodes of great generosity, um, uh, often extraordinary acts of, 
of kindness and mercy. But not all of Mecca escaped Muhammad's wrath. Flush with victory, his troops marched straight to the Kaaba. Seven times they circled the shrine, as those who'd come to seek its protection appealed to their idols. But it was not the pagan people Muhammad had come to destroy. It was their gods. He raised his staff, and the tribal gods of his ancestors smashed into dust. When Muhammad entered Mecca and entered the shrine and destroyed the idols in the shrine, this is of great cultural and symbolic importance in Islam. By breaking the idols, he was breaking apart the tribal system in which each tribe really had its own independent deity. This was shocking to the Bedouin. This was saying the gods of our fathers are being destroyed. In some sense, you're saying that our fathers themselves were deluded. How can you say this in a tradition in which relationships to one's father and tribe were primary? So this act of iconoclasm then um, is seen um, as, a, as an act of um, prophetic violence that has just as much importance in Islamic tradition as um, Moses' breaking of the tablets when he saw the idolatry at Mount Sinai or Jesus' um, casting the money sellers out of the temple. The destruction of the idols was a new beginning, a breaking from the past and the creation of a powerful new force. Mecca was just the beginning. One after another, the tribes of a nation were summoned to the fold and united under the banner of Islam. A worldwide community of faith was begun, born in an extraordinary alignment of history, personality, and conviction. What Muhammad did was to bring a sense of solidarity, a sense of mission, and he united all these separate segments within the peninsula, from then on moved eastward, westward, northward, southward. The Muslims turned to the north, swept into present-day Lebanon and Syria, They continued west into Egypt and quickly across North Africa, fortifying the coastline of the Mediterranean. Only the seas stopped them. Its growth was so explosive uh, from uh, 622, the year one of the Islamic calendar, um, within 50 years, people whose father had had been camel herders, were now governing one of the major empires in world history. Within 200 years, it extended from Spain to China. The Muslims absorbed the Sasanian Empire of Iran and two-thirds of the Christian Byzantine Empire. By now, the empire was larger than Rome. It stretched from Morocco in the west to the Indus River in the east, where the border of India is today. How had it happened that so small an army could conquer an area so large, so fast, so easily? Islam's success in expanding into the central Middle East and in, across North Africa was due in, in large part because people were fed up with previous regimes. So the idea that Muslims were going across the world saying convert or die is, is really not accurate, not at all. That it didn't have a heavy hand, it didn't rule with a heavy hand, they, they allowed the, the conquered peoples to maintain their 
their administrative uh, structures. They allowed the Christians and the Jews to maintain their religious law and to be governed by them. And so, in many cases, uh, conquered peoples did not feel the presence of the, the new regime very heavily. Certainly for individuals who felt themselves uh, exploited or downtrodden by an oppressive and even sometimes parasitic priesthood, the idea of Islam being a religion essentially free from clergy must have seemed very attractive. It's the times that creates the movement and sometimes the men. The Roman Empire had collapsed, the Byzantine Empire wasn't strong enough. There was a need for a new vision, a new uh, way of looking into life. And I think what happened at that time, Mohammed's mission, filled the void that uh, the societies wanted. They really wanted some sort of solidarity in their lives. The lessons of the Quran, so successful for the Muslims in Medina and Mecca, were playing out on a global scale. As the conquest swept through Syria, the Muslims held their Friday prayers in the Church of St. John the Baptist in Damascus, allowing its Christian congregation to continue their services on Sunday. Side by side, the two faiths shared the same building in peace. As the Muslim community grew, they bought the old church from the Christian congregation and built a huge mosque on the site. With Byzantine artisans, they decorated it with golden mosaics of an Islamic paradise. The great mosque of Damascus would become a model for new mosques to come all across the empire. The Arabs transformed their conquered lands, maintaining, improving or expanding the infrastructure. In Tunisia, building on Roman ruins, they devised an ingenious system of water purification, using gravity to separate fresh water from sediments. Part of this system were these two enormous basins that they built outside the city walls. The clean fresh water would flow over the, into the larger basin, where it would then be distributed by pipes to the city. Um, this is, you know, hundreds of years before anyone in Europe ever thought of having running water. All over you find schemes for bringing water from the mountains where there was more water to the plains where there might be less water. They resurrected elaborate irrigation systems, filling the old stone aqueducts with precious water. Agriculture flourished as life-giving staples like wheat were introduced to the Mediterranean region. But Muslims saved their most monumental feat for the holy city of Jerusalem. Islam's first great work of art is the Dome of the Rock. It was built in a city that was holy to Christians and Jews, and it's spectacular. Like Mecca and the Kaaba, the significance of this holy site goes back to Abraham, for the rock within is said to be the place he nearly sacrificed his son. It was built to rival the nearby church of the Holy Sepulchre, where Jesus was said to have been buried. What's extraordinary about the Dome of the Rock is how perfect it is. 
People revered this site as some place that was holy to Abraham and to Isaac. Imagine, if you will, these new guys coming in and taking over this piece of prime real estate and building a new building for a new religion that sits on top of a mountain and sparkles and glitters in the sunlight for everyone to see. This is not something that a fly-by-night. This is something big and important. Islam has come to stay. In just a hundred years, Muhammad's vision had transformed the spiritual and political map of the world, and his followers had established an empire larger than Rome. But Muhammad never lived to see it. In the eleventh year of the Islamic calendar, 632 AD, only two years after the taking of Mecca, Muhammad died. Medina fell into despair. For days, the city was consumed with sorrow and ceremony. He's known to have said that he wanted to be buried very simply, with no marker over his grave. He didn't want people to worship his grave. That would interfere with their worship of God. God had spoken to them only through Muhammad. Now that the prophet had left them, perhaps God would as well. Muhammad's death set up a crisis in the young Islamic community. The question of succession was the first thing that really occupied people's concerns. At this point, there was a divergence of opinion as to how the community should go about choosing a new leader. According to the Shiites, the faction, the Shia of Ali, Muhammad had indeed designated Ali, his son-in-law and cousin, as his successor. The opinion that came to be the majority opinion, or the Sunni opinion, held that Muhammad had not appointed a successor during his life, but had said, after I am gone, choose one from among your peers, from among the elders. And from the house there came out the man who would be his successor, Abu Bakr. And he addressed the people and said, if you worship Muhammad, know that he is dead. If you worship God, know that he lives forever. Here was the secret to Islam's strength and profound influence. The unifying power of one God, merciful and compassionate, the power of one people, bound by a common faith. Muhammad did not lead the conquest or create the empire to come. The transforming power of his message did. Out of that message would spring a font of knowledge that would transform humanity as Islam continued to spread its reach far and wide. Awaiting the Muslims would be a new age. They would be destined for enlightenment, for new horizons, and a clash of great powers, the like of which the world had never seen.